Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. Yisrael, Yehonatan Dawid with you here. Humbly so on what they call the 9th of January, 2022. Y'all remember the whinings? Some of y'all gray hairs out there. I know Ms. Bray, she don't know nothing about that. But uh, y'all know those whinings. They was holding it down for us back in the day. Andre Crouch and the boys. So, we have officially finished this series of The Greatest Story Ever Told, which is a love story. The Greatest Story Ever Told is a love story. And uh, we are now on Kahalo Hashiba, the seven assemblies. And this is going to lead us into Daniel Revelations, the assembly assemblies. And I'm telling you, it's like the wine and said, it won't be long. It will not be long. This thing is real, boys and girls. This is real. And like I, I've been saying for years, the study of any text or scripture divorced from its cultural setting and historical context is insufficient for forming conclusions in regard to its intended meaning. If you don't give the narrative, paint it with the, the phylum or the milieu that it came from, you are divorcing the narrative from reality. The, the, the truth and reality are divorced from one another because you're using more moral relativism. What, what, and if you use more relativism, that means your narrative is subject to manipulation. That means what you're talking about is manipulation. So this is just like I said when the, the book of Eli, when the whole story is about how the evil villain wanted to get this book that Eli had and, 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 and the book was, we find out, was the Bible. So he can re-control the world based on how he interpreted the Bible. So we don't do that here at Yahweh for Christians. WFDR 1590 AM, Yohanathan Dawid with you here. Because we're going to give you authentic truth via original words. And this is going to help you to know and understand things better. Because, you know, like I said, I gave you the history of your KJV, how for over 200 years, you didn't have no Jehovah Jesus in it. In the official KJV, it took you almost 200 years just to get your Jesus in there. So why is he in there now? Moral relativism. If he wasn't in there when you first put the book out, the first seven printings of it, if I had touted that, you'd be, you'd be defending Isis. You would be... Uh, crashing me and arguing against me for using Jesus because in the Bible it would have been Jesus. but now here I am calling on y'all Yeshua and you're defending Jesus who wasn't even in your Bible all things flow to y'all Yeshua all things go through him and if you're not having a, 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 a narrative with him included is a waste of time. Genesis 28, 12. I'm just going to give like a summary or follow-up of the greatest story ever told before we go into the introduction of the seven assemblies. We're not going to do the first uh, so-called church until next week. But in Genesis 28, 12, there's an interesting word in here that's only found one time in the entire Torah. If you don't read it in the language of slavery, which is English. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to the heavens. And there the Malachim of Elohim were ascending and descending on it. Now, our Bible says, says um, ladder. That Ivorite word is sulam. Sulam is only found once right here in the entire Torah and the narrative says that Malachim which are messengers were ascending and descending from heaven to Yaakov this is a genetic dream coming from the seat of Yahweh to the genes of Yaakov a covenant from this man now let's get a second witness John 1 and 51 in what you call the New Testament the Brit Hadashah John 1 51 let's get a witness another witness this comes from the very mouth of Yahweh himself and he said to them 
Most assuredly I say unto you, hereafter you will see heaven open and the Malachim of Yahweh ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here he is, he's quoting Genesis 28, 12. And he's saying, it is all about me. It's about me, it's nobody else. This, you're looking at the covenant here before your face from the seed of Yahweh through the genes of the Eberit to give you the Besorah message, the message that you call the gospel of the reconciliation of Yahweh and man in this greatest story, the reconciliation of how Yahweh brought man back to himself, though we fell against him. And this is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful thing that you cannot get in English. This word sulam, ladder, is a genetic word. What we call it today is deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. So this is a DNA dream, and the messengers are what you would call ribonucleic acid, RNA. You know, you have messenger genes that go along and ride along the DNA to get the message, the message of the phenotype of the organism, what it's going to look like, whether it's a man or a mouse. So these Malachim, what you call angels, are the messengers that go up and down the sulam, the ladder. So we're going to see one of these messengers in the first so-called church of Ephesus. We're going to just do an intro today, but next week we're going to go into uh, the first Malachim of the, who gives the message of the since we've already finished the greatest story ever told, Yahweh is now resurrected after the third day and found to be innocent. And his sacrifice, one of them is a burnt sacrifice, a sweet, savory odor to Yahweh's nostrils. By the way, that's a very important reality because of the five senses we had, the only sense that was not used to sin was a sense of smell. So that's very important. How Yah that's why Yahweh loves a sense of smell. He takes it very seriously. Make sure you are clean before you approach Yahweh because Yahweh Shua smell went up to Yahweh's nose after he came out of the tomb and he gave himself as a wave offering and a heave offering to Yahweh and he accepted it. The greatest story ever told, which is a love story, we have found out if you followed me these past, I think was it was five weeks, it came via the branch or the Hebrew word is gephel, the vine, and it came through the tunic. If you follow me, you, you should have been amazed by this. How the thread of the branch that fell from the tree of life and the tunic. Yahweh made two tunics for Adam and Eve. And how he united those, the, the whole story, the entire story of the Torah is getting those two items back together. And it came together with the the sacrifice of Yahweh Shua on the almond tree in the Mount of Olives. So he was on the rod. He was on the branch that Adam used. Matter of fact, I was just reading today just how about how Yahweh gave Adam that branch to till the ground and back out to the land where he was created. He was not created in the Garden of Eden. He was created outside the Garden of Eden. And so that the the Anna was telling with was end up going to be the answer to the reconciliation of Adam back to Yahweh the set, the first Adam back to the second Adam he died on that and he was wearing I believe it was the cloak the, the tunic that Mother Hawa had on not Adam's tunic it was Mother Hawa's tunic that same Hebrew word is was used that Jacob used to, to uh, put on Yusef. The coat of many, what we call the coat of many colors. That same Hebrew word is the word used for the, the, the tunics that Yahweh made for Adam and Eve and the tunic that Jacob put on Yusuf because it was the same tunic. And the greatest story ever told, which is a love story, culminated on the tree, the sacrifice that Yahweh should have made for you and me. And he had on that robe and he died on that outstretched arm of Yahweh, that tree. That's how the story went. But we, but we Hebrews still want to try to live by the 613. See, the 613 was given to us only, remember, only because we feared Yahweh's voice. 
Y'all was coming down Mount Sinai. This was the marriage culmination. This was going to be the marriage. We were supposed to get married to Yahweh right there on Mount Sinai. And then a year later, we were going to Canaan and commenced the taking the land. Well, we know how the story went. We feared Yahweh. And, 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 and then we didn't go into the land until 40 years later. Instead of one year later, we went in 40 years later. It was like 39 years later. So, in the in meantime, we still are in a formal marriage with Yahweh, but hasn't been consummated. And it still has not been consummated. It won't be consummated now until after the millennial kingdom. So, we had this marriage with him, but he had to now, since we said, no, nope, whatever you do, we'll say we'll do, just let Moses tell us, Moshe tell us. So, Yahweh Shul begins to go ahead and giving them the 613 commandments, and then he dropped the mic and walked away. Dropped the mic, bam! Since you, you, it, now, you don't want to go ahead and receive me, I come down to you to, to say, here I am, love me. Why do I want you to love me? Because I love you. And why do I love you? Because I made you after my image. That's why I love you. I made you after my image. No other, nothing else did I create out of my mouth. And when you with my hands, that I make after my image, but you. That's why I love you, and that's why you ought to love me. And that was it. And then we say, I do. And then we commence in taking the land. But that's not what happened. So then you say, okay, here's the paperwork. And now you got he dropped the mic on those six thirteens. And 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 we're supposed to just go ahead and try to keep that. But there's good promises with that blood covenant. It's long life, but not eternal life. See, here's the thing. The word says is a, is a crown of everyone to wants to die. We are to love Yahweh. You love Yahweh with all our heart and all our might and all our soul and love our fellow man as ourself. And if we do that, in order to do that, we know we're going to die. But what we have to do is we have to die of ourselves so Yahweh can reborn us. Everybody has been born, all right? You're here, you've been born, obviously. But if you want to live again and more abundantly, you're going to have to be reborn. So in actuality, the man who lives forever is born twice. You're born once naturally, and then once you come into the knowledge of Yahweh Shua, you are reborn. You are born again. If you are born again, you will not die a second time. There are many of us who have gone on before, but Yahweh says they are sleeping. You own, so if you're born twice, you're only going to die once. It's the man who's only born once, the natural birth through the woman's womb, and, and lives his whole life for himself, selfishly, and does not get reborn, does not teshuva, does not turn around. He never gets reborn. He's going to die the second death. So born once, you die twice. Born twice, you die once. But what is your testimony? Is it name it and claim it, blab it and grab it? We have always tried to box Yahweh. From the beginning, Adam said, okay, Yahweh says, oh, uh, Al-C is going to crush his head, thinking, hey, Cain was going to be the one. We know that didn't happen. Then, then we saw what happened to Abel. Then they thought Seth would be the one. All the way, to the, all the way throughout the time, even the disciples themselves, still thinking when he, after he resurrected, that he was going to take the kingdom at that time. They've always we try to tell Yahweh how to do his story, how he's going to do it. We don't want to go through the pain and the strain and the drain. But if you don't have that, then what's your testimony? What's your learning? I mean, so Abraham gets called to 50 years old and says, okay, you're going to take all this land. All this land is going to be yours and your seed is going to be greater than the stars. And immediately him and he, uh, his wife Sarah starts popping out babies. Wow. So who wouldn't take that deal? Makes that, what makes Abraham unique and special and different then? Because who wouldn't take that deal? Yahweh comes to me and says, Yohan Dazan, hey, this whole world is going to be repopulated with you and your wife in righteousness. I'm like, hey, sign me up. Where, where do I sign? But we know what Abraham went through. We know that he, that didn't come to culmination for another 50 tough, difficult, faith-growing years. So that he has a testimony Going by Yahweh's script that he wouldn't have had going by his own script, which is immediately Sarah starts popping out babies. 
Your sock the same. Your coat the same. Dawid the same. Everybody the same. Read the book. Everybody's going through their lines as it is given to them. Because then they have testimony. What testimony do you have naming it and claiming it, blabbing and grabbing it? Everything you do, like the, like remember the old Michael Jackson video where he was walking everywhere he touched turned to gold. Everything you touch turn to gold, everything you open up your mouth turn to gold. What testimony do you have to get somebody else to believe in Yahweh Shua? Because what you have working for you, you have Yahweh working for you. You're not working for him. What you have is a genie. That's what you have. You rub the bottle and you get whatever you want. You got a genie. You got a, 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 a Aladdin's genie. That's not what Yahweh is. He doesn't do magic. He doesn't work for you. He wants relationship. Not him as your butler coming to you. You rang. Oh, heal this, fix that, lavish this money on you. Your business thrive. Everything's good. Multi your children are multiplying and increase. Everything goes according to the way you see it in your limited mind. There's Yahweh just serving you like a butler. You rang. I don't think so. It doesn't go that way. The greatest story ever told is Yahweh remaking us. Pastor William preached a stirring sermon yesterday talking about how the hardest, most difficult job is to remake somebody's mind. And that's true. Because you, like, a, like we've been learning here for years, the creation was not a creation that you read in Genesis 1 1. It was a recreation. Yahweh recreating the earth, this earth that we're in now, from a previously destroyed earth. And he created, recreated out of Tohu wa Bohu. Another word is only found twice in the Old Testament, once there and then once in Isaiah, where he says that the nation, us, are tohu wa bohu, and we were, and we're just now coming out of that dust and, and, and total destruction where we didn't know who we were. Now we're thriving and learning every day. More and more he was learning who they are, but it started out of tohu wa bohu. But also, likewise, in the second birth, remember I said you have to be born twice. We've all been born once, but to be, be reborn, Yahweh works out of the tohu wa bohu of our minds. Our minds is out from our heart, from our labor. He is remaking us and molding us after his image. He is the potter. We are the clay. And he is working out of, he is working hard to get our minds to see him as he is. And to see Yahweh is to love Yahweh and to seek a relationship with him, a working relationship. Not one where as soon as you, every time you need something, then you come running and crying to him. But it's a real relationship, a working relationship where you desire intimacy with him. Into me see. He sees into you and you see into him. And you desire a relationship where you just talk with him and praise him because you were born, you were created to praise Yahweh. Everything created was created to praise him primarily. That's the primary reason for existing. After that, you have to be fruitful. You can't just, just he give you one talent, you come back to him with one talent. You have to be fruitful. That means you got to mirror him to bring others in to praise. To do what? To praise Yahweh. That's your job. He gave us various talents to do so. He gave me a talent for understanding this word. And for writing it. And he's teaching me how to teach it. What is your testimony? Those who love the blood law are going to die with it because it doesn't last forever. The bloodthirsty, they want talking about the power of the blood. There ain't no power of the blood. Not eternal power. It's temporary. Fear does not get you saved. Fear wakes you up and calls you to attention. That's what it does. Fear gives you gets your attention, but you cannot live in fear. Yahweh does not want you to live forever in fear. He wants you to live in love. Yahweh says in Isaiah 55, 8, that his ways are not your ways, and your ways are not his ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So we cannot box Yahweh into our reality, our relative moral relativism, and see, and see things in our way in our times. We need to see things through his way. You know, here's a, I've used these examples many times. Even the idea of what is rich. You know, 
the the millionaire thinks the billionaire is rich. The billionaire thinks the trillionaire. You know, you're going to have your first trillionaire coming up soon. But we never see ourselves as rich. But if someone, if you was from the Congo, where the average home is making less than five hundred dollars a year, they see you as rich, and you are. I am. We are rich. And Yahweh Yeshua says that we are to live each day like our daily bread. But we don't have to work today to get fed. We don't realize how overflowing rich we are, how we are fat like Geshurun. We grew fat, wax fat. We are obese, the, the word says in Deuteronomy. We've gotten obese and not realizing it that how, how much he is blessing us. And then our ears get numb and dull to hearing his voice. Here I am. Come to me, into you who are heavy laden and rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Stop trying to gain the largesses of this world, which all they do is separate us from Yahweh Shua. Thankful be to Yahweh Shua, who tells us in James 2.13 that grace triumphs over judgment. The two commandments of loving Yahweh and loving your fellow man triumphs over the 613. The love story came to us through the branch and the tunic and it was united on the tree of the sacrifice. And now we have been scattered all across the, the plains of the earth, the four corners, and he is again uniting us in, in the process of uniting the two sticks together. In this greatest story ever told, through loving Yahweh and loving your fellow man. And grace triumphs over. Let's read Mark 10. Let's get a, this is a deeper understanding. We're still wrapping up the greatest story. We're only going to do a intro to the uh, Ephesus, the first so-called church that was called out. Yahweh's calling us out. Mark 10, 17 to 22. Mark 10, 17 to 22. You know the story of the rich young ruler. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Tob, teacher, what will I do that I may inherit eternal life? This man came running to him, fell down before Yahweh Shua. All right? Yahweh Shua said, why did you call me Tob? No one is Tob but one, and that is Yahweh. Why did he say that? Because Yahweh, if you're saying that Yahweh is Tob, don't say just a, because you only he only can be either who he say he is uh, or he's not. He either is a creator or he's not. He's not a good man. He didn't say he's a good man. He said he is the creator. He says, I am. He said, you've seen the Father, you've seen me. So either Yahweh sure is the creator or he's not. So don't put connect him to a good man who does good works. Do not do that. So either I am who I say I am or, that's, or I'm not. No, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Go ahead and give him the list, all right? And he answered and said to him, Rabbi, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Yahweh Shua looked at him and loved him. When we go to Ephesus, Ephesus we're going to see that Ephesus, the very name means desired. Yahweh loved this, what you call church, this Hakalo, this Hakala. He loved them, and and we see that he died for them. And we're gonna go. You're gonna learn so much when we go through these so-called seven churches. Stay with us here on Yahweh for Christians. So Yahweh looked at this man and he loved him. It says it took time to say he loved him when he looked at him. One thing you lack. Go your way, so whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in Hashemayim. And come, take up your, your stake and follow me. See, he said, you know, you kept the 613, good. Now you're only missing one thing, the love. The love. You're missing one thing. I love you. The record says right here he loves him. Now you need to love me. So you don't need all that stuff. That stuff got you to me. That, that's good. And you already got the 613 on your belt. Good. Because the 613 speaks of me. He says, read the scriptures. In all of the volume of the book, it speaks of me, Dawi says in the Psalms. It all speaks about Yahweh Shu. So good. The 613 is a good thing. It gives you long life. But I give you eternal life. 
So you, so the, this covenant goes from blood to water. Sell your stuff. Come on. Hang with, hang with me. Let, walk with me. Talk with me. Be with me. But what happened? And he answered and said to him, uh, uh, But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Why? Because he had great possessions. Because he had stuff. He had stuff. He had great stuff, which you have, which I have. Right now, could you lose all your stuff and go live out in the woods? Oh, well, I'm going to show you people who've done that, that and they're not Hebrew. If all you people want to beat your chest about being Hebrew, stick with me and find out who the remnant is. Find out who the, who the, those who are with the remnant are. Find out who, who the 144,000 are. And find out who are those who are with the 144,000. Stay right here. Your hometown dog week with you on Yahweh for Christians. So it wasn't the 613. He turned down the two. Love Yahweh and love your fellow man. The two. So are you going to fail on just that? You who want to blast Mother Hawa, the head in the, in the garden, only one law. You can eat anything, any tree you want from here except that one. As a matter of fact, if you eat from this one right here, you live forever. One thing, one thing they were told to do, don't eat from that one. And here we are today in so-called 2022, Yahweh says one thing, love me and love your fellow man. One thing. And you can't keep that? But I bet you're going to go blast somebody who don't keep pace, pace up the way in time you keep pace up. They seat seats. They ain't, they ain't wearing their seat seats today. I know a brother who, who, who got circumcised. Should be, who told you to get circumcised because you found out about the name of Yahweh Shua? So you're going to be just like Mother Hawa. The one thing you told to do, you can't even do that one thing. The one thing you told not to do, you cannot do that one thing. The love Yahweh and the love his image, which is your fellow man who made after Yahweh's image. Not mankind. We are in the age of man. Number six is the number of man. This is the sixth day of, of the creation. We're in the number of man. And we know the mark of the beast is already amongst us. So either you're going to be at the image of Yahweh or the image of the beast. Those who are the image of the beast are keeping the 613. Wait till you find out who these beasts are. You're going to be shocked and surprised. I think you need to go ahead and, and share this information. Get somebody else here to tune in on this station. Tune in on to the, the YouTube channels and the videos I send out. Because the narrative I'm going to give you is unlike what you hear from any pulpit. And it's going to come from the book. Isaiah 49. See, uh, 54 weeks. 54 weeks. I went through all those Torah portions. All to direct you to Yahweh Shua. Isaiah 49, 1 through 7. Because it's bigger and greater than the box we put out, put Yahweh Shua in. We got to stop putting them in that box. 49, 1 through 7. Listen, O coastlands, to me and take heed, you peoples, from afar. Yahweh has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made me mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. Remember I told you what, what Yahweh means, the agreement. In his hand was the eternal agreement. And, and he gradually opens it and gives us more and more revelation of it. Of the one covenant. There ain't no more than one covenant. Stop thinking you're so smart about breaking down the covenants. The Noah High covenant, the Abraham covenant, all that. Stop all of that. There's one covenant. There's just a gradual revelation of it. And I'm the one that showed you that the, that's why you need to learn the original words. Yaad is the agreement. And what does the man of sin do? He shakes your hand. And what is the Hebrew word for liar? Shaker. And that's why they shake the, your hand for their agreement. Because they lie. They are liars. And he, has, and, and he has made me a polished shaft. And his quiver he has hidden me. And he has said to me, You are my servant, O Yisrael. 
And servant means Eber, slave, slave to Yahweh. You are my servant, my Eber, my slave, in whom I will be glorified, if you will. I don't like the word, but then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with Yahweh. And my work is with my mighty one. And now Yahweh says, who formed me from the womb. See, this agreement is from before the creation of the world. And to be the servant, read Romans 8. From the womb to be his Eber, to bring Jacob back to him. This is from the womb, to bring Jacob back before there was a Jacob, before there was a Sulam, the genetic revelation. So that Israel is gathered to him. Talking about the gathering, the gathering, the two sticks. Because I will be glorious in the eyes of Yahweh, and my mighty one will be in my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. So you got Jacob and you got Israel. That's two different groups of peoples, okay? I will also give you as a light to the Goyim. That's the third, there's three groups of people out there that's coming together. In this revelation of Yahweh Shua. That you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus saith Yahweh, the Redeemer. Remember, I'm the one who taught you that Redeemer is go well. If you read it in English, it just says Redeemer. Anybody can go uh, you buy something back from the, from the thrift store or whatever. Over the pawn shop. If you got the ticket, you pay the money. But go well, Redeemer means only a genetic person related can do that. Did you learn anything about Boaz and Ruth? So this word Redeemer is a genetic word. Just like the word ladder is a genetic word. Yahweh is only saving man, not mankind. And mankind is among us looking just like you. Only Yahweh can discern the wheat from the tares. He reads the heart. He knows who's his and who's not his. To him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the Eber of rulers, kings will see and arise. Princes will, will worship because Yahweh, who is faithful, the Kodesh one of Israel, he has chosen you, you who love Yahweh Shua, over Mammon, over money. You who love Yahweh Shua, who seek intimacy, relationship with him, like he seeks with you when he came down from Mount Sinai. So here we are, if you read this, hopefully you will stop blasting the so-called white man, the so-called Jew man, the so-called red man. Stop blasting other people because Yahweh has three groups of people out there that he's bringing together that are made after his image. He got, Yahweh should not just come for Jacob. He says it right here. He says, this is bigger than that. Stop boxing me. There are three groups of people who tells you right here in Isaiah 49, specifically in verse 6. Read it again. See, it's Yahweh gives us the or he said in the beginning, he said, Let there be light, let there be or is not light for the eyes. He gave you the sun for the light for the eyes. He gave you or for the light of your heart, your lab. Yahweh gave you or light to see with your heart. Not with your eyes to segment peoples based on the melanin and content of their skins. That is so elementary and, gen and, 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 and unimaginative. Yisrael, Hebrews are the ones out there on social media blasting in their ignorance and immaturity. Ignorance and immaturity is showing that you have a long way to go to learn this Basorah. If you're out there slashing and blasting other people because of the content of their skin and if you're out there naming it and claiming it blabbing it and grabbing it thinking you're going to get the largest of this earth when the whole thing about the market of the beast is buying and selling so you're going to pray to Yahweh for more stuff to buy and sell with that doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense let me give you a brief list and this is not even complete of the greatest most righteous people in the history of the world who are not Hebrew they don't have the, the Judah shirts with the lion roaring and a hat and the Judah hat with the lion. Everybody thinks they're from Judah. Nobody says they're from Issachar. Nobody's from Gad. Nobody's from Dan. They're all from Judah. And they're wearing their little seat seats. 
And this is what this, this, this look at this. Let me start off with Eob. A Edomite. A red Edomite. Are you as righteous as his left pinky toe? A man who endured 22 years of pain without denouncing Yahweh. 22 years he went through that. An Edomite. How about Yitro? I sp Yitro, one of the most huge righteous prophets in the history of the world that no one talks about. So much so that I took a, a whole uh, broadcast, wasn't planning to, I was planning on talking about Tohu Wabohu, and I did a little blurb on Yitro, and I had to go through the whole th show with it. And I had to do Tohu Wabohu the very next week. That's how big he is, because through his genes, we get the Rechabites. Again, my ears have never heard the Hebrews talk about the Rechabites. A people, we know how about a single person, a people so righteous, y'all would say they will never lack a man standing before me. That means they are amongst us. They, actually, you don't see them. These are the righteous ones on the earth. Not the Hebrews, the Rechabites. And that comes through the genes of Yitro. This is why Moshe wanted to have him hang around with him. Moshe knew, but Yitro was smarter than that. He said, uh, I know how stiff necked y'all are. I know how you're going to be. How about Zippor? You know, Moshe's wife who fed him for 10 years while he was locked up by her father and kept him alive. Otherwise, he would have been dead. The only woman we know of who circumcised her sons and who was humble in her position, never hear a peep from Zippor while her husband was doing his job. She just humbly went on her way and died quietly. That's a righteous woman. A quiet woman. That's a righteous woman. Quiet. His other wife, Thar Tharbis, the Cushite, the first wife he had, and he never even copulated with her. She was even more quiet than Zipporah. Quiet, humble, and stayed in her place. How many women as righteous as this woman? They want to be on the front. They want to be loud and proud and up on top and over the man. But see, here's the thing. We know Moshe is the lawgiver. He is the oracle, the only human being that Yahweh spoke through, Yahweh physically spoke through him. Yahweh's voice. How else can over three million people hear him speak? Unless it was the very voice of Yahweh. So, yet he had two wives, non-Hebrew. And these marriages prefigure the Besora, which you call the gospel, going into all the Goyim that we read about in Isaiah 49. How this word is to go to all the world, not just Hebrews. Everyone made after the image of Yahweh. So what Moshe had here, the lawgiver of the 613, two wives, neither of them Hebrew. How about Lot? Abraham, one of the greatest prophets ever, knew something special about his nephew. And he went out with 300 men to rescue Lot against five kings, five nations with just 300 men. Because he knew something special about Lot. And if we didn't have Lot, you wouldn't have had Ruth. And if you didn't have Ruth, remember, the woman's seed is the one that crushes the serpent's head. Yahweh Shua comes through the woman's seed, not Abraham's seed. But we got Ruth because of Lot. What about Rahab? Rahab, whenever Rahab's name comes up, the next word that comes behind it is whore, harlot. But what is she? This was a, this Canaanite woman, Mary Salmon. You can find it in Matthew 1 5. It's not making it up. And out of that, who did they make? Boaz. What did Boaz do? Married Ruth. Hamash da Dawid comes out of that, and eventually Yahweshua Hamashiach. See how the greatest love story goes to a full circle? Could, would you write a story like that where Yahweshua comes through two whores? Two whores? All these women who are not Hebrew? You wouldn't write the story like that. You wouldn't write it like that. This love story. They remember, Hasatan is following it closely. And it fools him. Because if he had known that the greatest love story would end with sacrifice, a complete burnt sacrifice looking like defeat, he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have co-opted that. He wouldn't have killed the Messiah if he knew that it was going to crush his head. In his bloodthirsty hatefulness, he fell. He fell for the okie doke. Like most of you out there doing now. And he's giving you the, the bloody 613 and you're trying your best to get into the kingdom with it. How about the woman at the well? 
Do you know, do you realize that the first person ever to deliver the Besor message was in the Hebrew? The Besor, what you call the gospel? It was the woman at the well. Yahweh Shua spoke to her. What? His disciples putting Yahweh Shua in their box of how they think the love story is supposed to go. It's supposed to come in here and kill the Romans and we take the land back. They like, what are you doing speaking to that woman? He had them in their box. They were wrong. That woman was received. She teshuva and turned and received the message of Yahweh Shua. Went back to her town and gave the message of Yahweh Shua. Only. She didn't tell them to start circumcising themselves. She didn't tell them to stop eating bacon. She didn't tell them to start wearing sit seats. She just spoke about Yahweh Shua. And when they came back months later, the whole town was converted and waiting for the, a sermon from Yahweh Shua, which they got. But you want to beat your chest about being Hebrew and put down other people on social media. A woman, a non-Hebrew woman at that, is the first person to give the Besor message of Yahweh Shua. How about the Good Samaritan? Don't even know his name because it's not important. All we know that he was told. And Yahweh said there's nothing told but his father. So this man must have had in his heart the love of Yahweh. And we know what the Good Samaritan did. And, and we know he wasn't Hebrew. Let's go to another so-called, what we would call an unsavory woman. Tamar, who beguiled her father-in-law, Yehuda, and had sex with him. But we know that Tamar, go to Matthew 1, 3, is in the line of the Messiah. So you got three women, Ruth, Rahab, and Tamar. All these three women we would not even so much as want to sit down with in their self-righteousness. Yet the Hamashiach came through these women. And there's many others. Z the, the, the widow Zerapah. Yahweh told the Hebrews, Hey, y'all so righteous, then why did Elijah go to your mother's? He went to Zerepah. Elijah went to her during the famine. Not to the Hebrew women. The Roman centurion, Yahweh Shua himself, uh, uh, validated this man. Wouldn't you like Yahweh Shua to speak up for you? That would be great to have his name on your resume. Your job is guaranteed. Yahweh Shua says, the Hebrews didn't have much faith as this man. He said, listen, you said my daughter, she's healed. You ain't got to come over there. You keep doing what you're doing. I'm going home to my healed daughter. But how much faith do you have? You praying for healing, but your, your medicine cabinet is still full of pills. If you have faith like the Roman centurion, first, before you pray to Yahweh, you go upstairs, empty your cabinet of all your medications, flush them down the toilet, then pray for your healing. Because you're already claiming it. What do you need the pills for? The Roman centurion, he did it. He said, I, my daughter's healed. I'm going back to go get her. But we want to beat our chest about how we love Yahweh, how we're Hebrew. And we're going to talk and hate other peoples, especially on social media. We got a long way to come. Wait till we start talking about these so-called seven churches. And especially the first one, Ephesus. And you're going to learn something. You're going to learn to love. I hope you learn it. I hope so. There are many others. Nebuchadnezzar, didn't he humble himself? He humble, How about Artaxerxes? Didn't he support the Hebrews? He Didn't he... Write edicts for us to fight for ourselves at Xerxes. How about how about Ahasuerus? Ahasuerus didn't he not uh, help the Hebrews and, get, and didn't they give us money to get back to our land and, and rebuild the temple? Yet you're going to blast Trump. I bet you wish Trump was there now because he didn't buy into that that uh, narrative, that COVID narrative. He wouldn't have had those mandates of getting shots and all that stuff. I bet you wish you had Trump in office now, and not that one you got now. Everything he opened his mouth is, take the shot, take the shot. He wakes up, take the shot, take the shot. They took the, the lecture from Trump because he wouldn't buy that narrative. But you got righteous men in the past, Nebuchadnezzar, Eterxerxes, and Ahasuerus, non-Hebrews, who helped the Hebrews. How about the woodcutters that fooled Yahushua? Yahweh says, don't make no covenant with nobody. But he made a covenant with these woodcutters because he didn't Google them up and look them up and check their history. Found out they were supposed to be killed. So we had to keep the covenant with them. So when we went into the Holy Land, already we were a mixed people with the woodcutters. Well, we ended up making them woodcutters. They weren't woodcutters, but they ended up being our woodcutters. Non-Hebrews. And I told you, some of the greatest people in the history of my life that have helped me were people who didn't look like me. So-called white men, so-called Jews, so-called red men were some of the greatest peoples in my life and to this day who have helped me. The ones who been the most thorn in my side, the thorns in my side, was so-called black man. 
the so-called Hebrews have hurt me and my wife and my family. So-called Hebrews have hurt me and sought to destroy me. So-called black men have sought to hurt me and have hurt me and my wife and family. But you want to call yourself black when nowhere in the Torah that Yahweh calls his people as a people black. Nowhere. You end up identify yourself with Yahweh, a lover of Yahweh Shua. And hopefully you're Hebrew. If not, then you just, you are one who are grafted in. He did not call people by the machinations of, of color. Now, in Kahalot Hashiba, the greatest love story leads us to this. Now what? Now that Yahweh Shua has risen, resurrected, and he's going to come back again, there are seven spirits, and every last one of us are going to be cantered to one of these seven types of spirits. And you know it has to be a type. These seven so-called churches are a type. Because there were at least 15 assemblies called out ones in what today is, is Turkey. Corinth, Thessalonica, Philippi, Colossae, Galatia, none of these are listed in Revelations 1 and 2 of the seven so-called churches. Yet we have seven letters from the hand of Shaul, over half his work written to these five so-called churches, these assemblies, these kohalot, seven letters written to them, and they're not even mentioned in Revelations. The ones mentioned are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodica. And out of these seven, we only have one letter, and that's to the Ephesians. Now, Colossians, if you read in Colossians, um, I forget the, uh, the exact verse, I can give it for you next week. But in Colossians, it says that the letter of Colossians is to be read to the Laodicans also. So they get the letter of Col that was sent to the Colossians. Also, if you look at the narrative, even the, the, the letter of the Ephesians was supposed to be read to the Lydicans. So, we'll, we'll go into some detail to that next week. But, these seven, these, these Hakalo Hashiba, the seven assemblies that are spoke of in the first few books of Revelations, are a type. They are a type. And every last believer today, Hebrew and grafted in, are going to be put into one of these seven groups. And it's going to be interesting for you to figure out which one are you worshiping with right now. Which one? And I'm so, I love how Yahweh starts off right off the bat with, the, with Ephesus. With Ephesus. Because, oh man, wait till we talk about this group. There's a lot of us in Ephesus. A lot of you, not me. Pastor Williams, he, that's, he, he's the leader of the group I, I, I worship in, and they are not Ephesus, thankfully. But there are a lot of you out there who are, and you're strong, strong on social media. Strong. You know all 613 very well. But we're going to talk about that. So, but this is just the, this, the, the build up. Let's go to Revelations 1 1. Okay? Let's go to Gola. The actual name of the book is Gola. And if you go to Revelation 1 1, and it reads, The revelation of Yahweh Shua HaMashiach, which Elohim gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. Now, if he said that over 2,000 years ago, here we are in 2022, do you think we need to be on our game now? Do you think we need to be paying attention to the times? Right now, do you think we need to be frolicking and trying to name and claim, blab and grab and crying for this and crying for that? When they said, when Yahweh says it must come to pass shortly. We're on fumes now. The gas is gone. Time is, if it was short then, it's short now. And it says this message is being given by his Malak. Malak just means messenger. Yahweh Shua is the special messenger. He himself personally come to Yachanan. And in verse 2 it reads, Who bore witness to the word of Yahweh and to the testimony of Yahweh Shua HaMashiach to all things that he saw. 
First, that means his eyes physically saw it. So this is not faith. This is not believing. This is actuality. He is going to, this book of Revelation is written down by what his eyeballs see. And second of all, it says that it is the testimony of Yahweh Shua HaMashiach. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Yahweh Shua HaMashiach. There is no such thing as prophesying in any other name. The Edut, throughout, from Genesis to Revelations, anytime it talks about the Edut, a testimony, it is talking about the special messenger of Yahweh, Yahweh Shua. So if you got somebody preaching in another name, he ain't prophesying. Prophecy only comes in this name. It tells you right here and in many other places in that name and in that name only. You can't talk about nothing. Remember, I told you everything comes through him. He said in John 1 51, everything comes through me. I am the X man. Everything comes through me. So in the name of Yahweh Shua, there's no name given among men under heaven by which we must, M U S T, be saved. Hallelujah, Yahweh. Skipping all down to verse 5. Well, let's go to verse 4. Because verse 4, it says, Yachanan to the, to the seven called out ones, which are in Asia, which today is Turkey, Chain, grace be to you, and shalom from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the Sheba, the Sheba spirits. So you see that these Ruachim are all a type. There are seven Ruachim, which are a type. Because there were, obviously there were more than seven assemblies in Asia. At the minimum, we can count 12 at the minimum. By name. I just named 12 of them right here. And there were, I believe, over 15. So just, if they just mentioned this seven, then that means they are a type. And to this day, in 2022, all of us will be grouped in one of these seven groups that we worship with. Be careful who you use, who you have as your shepherd. Be careful. Now, going to verse 5 of the first chapter of Gola, which you call Revelations. And from Yahweh Shua HaMashiach, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own dome. And his out of his dome came Dome Wamayim. So it's the from the old covenant to the new covenant. This comes straight from him. And he has he's the only entity that was in Hashemayim and in Sheol and came back up. So that means he has all power and authority. No other entity has done what this man did. He went down to Sheol. Did they repent? They had three days. Did they repent? No, they didn't. He came back up. Sadiq and righteous. And his sacrifice was accepted by Yahweh. Then verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Everyone pooped on Yahweh. But you don't want to have tough times. Name the man, the woman, name him, who didn't have their part in pooping on Yahweh Shua. Then he or she is supposed to be sitting on the throne. Let Yahweh Shua sit on his lap. Like sitting on Santa Claus's lap. Everyone did this man wrong. Everyone and every eye will see him. If you ain't got eyes, he's going to give you eyes so you can see. Because you didn't want to Shema, you didn't want to hear it. Yahweh sure says, I can show you better than I can tell you. So if you don't believe now, you're going to believe then. I, I suggest you believe it right now. And then in verse 8, he says, I am Aleph, I am Aleph and Tau. I am Aleph and Tau. The beginning, the bearer sheet, and the end. Who is and who was and who is to come, the El Shaddai. I think we got it clear who's talking here, who's given Yachanan the instructions in this last book that closes out the record that we're going to talk about after we finish these seven so-called churches. 
And then in verse 9, I, Yachanan, both your brother and companion in the tribulation. See, he has a story to tell because he was burned in oil. He survived it. That's how he ended up on the island of Patmos. Because of the law of double jeopardy, since he survived his judgment, they were not allowed to, to kill him, try to kill him again. So he was exiled to this deserted island, which is not far from Ephesus, by the way. All, he, you know, in pain. If you ever seen somebody who was burned, they are in a lot of pain. This man was burned from head to toe, and he was in pain in his last days writing this letter to the seven called out ones. So going to the next, let's go down to verse 11. And he says, I am Aleph and Tau, the first and the last, what you see right in they say far, and send it to the seven called out ones, the Sheba called out ones, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodica. Dica. We're going to talk about all that. Again, he sees all this. This is not what he heard. This is what he sees. So he says, also skipping down, my time always runs out. In verse 13, in the middle of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed in a garment. Yahweh Shua is in the middle of these seven spirits. They are all a type. There's only seven spirits of Yahweh, and we are each one of those types. Which one are you? Down, let's skip all the way down to verse 18 and then verse 20. And we'll close it out. Uh, we'll close it out. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive furthermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. See? Only he has the, those keys. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the Malachim, the seven called out ones are the seven lampstands, which you saw from the seven churches. So these angels are going to literally come to these seven assemblies and stand before them and give them their message. So next week, we're going to go into the first message. And I want to call to my brother, Rod, that you support his um, water distilleries that he has. And I use them. And we're going to have to need this clean water in these last days they have us. And my brother, Og Joe, for Just Deals, you can go on Facebook and see um, his Just Deals and his beautiful wife, Naturally Whipped, go and see her products. These are some of the people that support me in this message that you get every week. So, Yehonathan Dawi with here, Yahweh for Christians, and we're going to um, spend at least seven weeks. And by the way, we're on T minus 97 uh, for Peshach. T minus 97. That's coming faster than you know. Faster than you know. It's going to be here upon us soon. Get ready. Until then, Shalom Alakim. Peace be on you.